Hi everyone, welcome to the first guest lecture of the Deep Rock course. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Yu Xiang from University of Texas, Dallas. Yu directs the Intelligent Robotics Vision Lab at UT Dallas, where the group focuses on robotics and computer vision. Before joining the UT Dallas, uh, he was a senior research scientist uh, in NVIDIA Research Group at Seattle. And prior to that, he was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Washington, Seattle. He received his PhD from University of Michigan. Uh, and during his PhD, he also spent uh, time at AI lab in Stanford uh, as a visiting student researcher. So you has contributed to several works um, in the intersection of robot perception, deep learning, uh, computer vision, uh, focusing on uh, robot manipulation, which is the intersection that we are also looking at in this course. So it gives me great pleasure to have him as a guest lecturer. And today he's going to be talking about segmenting unseen objects for robot grasping. So without further ado, uh, I will let you take over. Thanks, Kasik. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, I'm happy to be here to share my recent work on segmenting unseen objects for robotic grasping. I have a look at the calendar of your course. It seems you have discussed uh, the paper on unseen object instance segmentation by learning RGBD feature embeddings. I was saying I checked the calendar from your class, and you have discussed this paper on uh, learning RGBD feature embeddings on segmenting unseen objects. And today we're going to I'm going to share our recent progress on segmenting unseen objects for robotic grasping. So let me start with some uh, motivation. So today we can see a lot of robots working in factories and warehouses. Here are some examples. Uh, these robots are doing various welding and assembling, material handling, and the delivering in factory and warehouses. According to the International Federation of Robotics, we can see the number of industry robots is increasing every year. Uh, so we have lots of robots working in factory and warehouses. But when we look at robots in human environments, uh, we can find these examples, such as cleaning robots, telepresent robots, or even smart speakers. But then the question is, why we cannot have more powerful robots that can assist the people in, at homes or offices? For example, can we have some mobile manipulator or even humanoids that can perform tasks in human environments and assist the people? So we would like to address this question and uh, uh, and, and you will see why this problem is difficult. So in the future, uh, I would imagine robots will do a lot of tasks for humans, such as take care of uh, our senior citizens, assist the disabled people and serve people in various places. And we hope to have robots that can cook a meal, clean a kitchen table, or even load a dishwasher for us. So these are some examples we hope we can have intelligent robots that can do for us autonomously. So in order to do these tasks, robots need to manipulate objects. Here are some examples of assembling and the cooking uh, robots need to do if they want to perform tasks for us. So it's obvious that robots need to do manipulation if they want to do tasks for us. So uh, in the traditional robot, robotic grasping, people have been working on model-based approaches. So here's the pipeline for model-based robotic grasping. We have perception, where we can do six object post estimation, so we can estimate the 3D location and the 3D orientation of, of, of objects. After we get the object post information, uh, we can do motion planning, where we can plan the trajectory of the robot arm and the grasp planning to plan where to grasp. And finally, we can have precision control to follow the planned trajectory. For example, in my previous work, uh, we have showed that if we have a if we set up a camera here onto the robot arm, so the robot can see these objects in this kitchen setting, then this camera can capture images of these objects. If we do 60 object post estimation, we can estimate the 3D location and the 3D orientation of these objects. So we can set up a planning scene. So this is a, a synthetic scene for planning and we can plan motion of the robotic, robotic arm to grasp these objects. With the plan, we can execute the plan in the real world and pick up these objects. So you can see this model-based approach can work, but the limitation is that we need to have a 3D model for each object. 
in this example, people have built the 3D models of this cracker box, the mug, and so on. So we can use these models for both perception and planning. But what if we want the robots to work in a cluttered kitchen, as you can see in this image? Clearly, right, we cannot have 3D model for every object. In this case, model-based model approach wouldn't work. So how can we enable robots to manipulate objects in the open domain or in the open world setting where we do not have 3D models of the objects? So we call this model free robotic grasping, and we can also tackle this problem with the perception, planning, and a control pipeline. So from our previous work, we showed that in perception, we can tackle the unseen object instance segmentation problem. So here, the problem is given an RGB image or an RGB image. We want to segment each object in the image. Unseen means that the segmentation model hasn't seen this object during training. So these objects are novel or unknown to the model. Once we can segment each object, since we have RGB uh, images, we can set up, uh, we can generate the point cloud of the thing and use the segmented point cloud of the objects to plan some grasps. So in this figure, this uh, green fox indicates two uh, parallel jaw grapper that's a clean and free, and the red fox indicates grasps that are inclusion with other objects. So with this plan, the clean and free grasps, we can also plan a motion of our arm to reach one of the grasps. So we can do position control and enable the robots to grasp these unseen objects. Uh, this, this is a model free pipeline. We can enable robots to grasp unseen objects. And today, uh, my focus is on how to segment unseen objects from the input image. That's the uh, unseen object instance segmentation problem. So uh, in the literature, we can classify unseen object instance segmentation approaches into two categories, the top-down approaches and the bottom up approaches. Examples of the top-down approaches include uh, mask ASEAN, right? I saw you have discussed the mask ASEAN for uh, detection and segmentation. It's uh, first given input image. There's uh, some layer to generate the uh, region of interest because our, uh, uh, with some region proposal network to generate the region of interest. Then with the our align layer, they can extract a feature for each region. And this feature will be classified and segmented. We call this a top-down approach because it's started from the whole image and then detect regions in the image and segment the regions. A recent work called Unseen Objects, uh, a model instance segmentation is based on this top-down approach, but they extended to segmenting objects and also segment the unseen, uh, the occluded parts. So they call it uh, the model se instance segmentation. On the other hand, we have bottom-up approaches. Here are some examples. For example, the uh, UIS net try to predict the object center for each pixel. So here, bottom up means we're starting from pixels and try to group pixels into objects. OURS net predict object center, then they can based on the predicted object center to cluster objects. So my previous work, I'm seeing a clustering network, network, learn some feature embeddings for each pixel, and we use mean shift clustering to group this pixel uh, into objects. A recent work, uh, applied test the time uh, uh, feature embedding adaptation. It's based on the using a net, but they adapt the image features during test time. They also achieve better performance. So these are bottom up approaches. We start from pixels and try to group pixels into objects. And my focus today is on bottom up, pro bottom -up approaches. Since uh, this method work works better than top down approaches in a single object instance segmentation. So let me start with a review of the previous approach uh, we propose. It's called the uh, UCN Unseen Clustering Network. I will be very brief since you have discussed this paper before. Basically, in this approach, we have a fully convolutional network that takes RGB and the depth image as input. Then this network produces a dense feature map. In this dense feature map, we have a feature vector for each pixel. So during training, since we have the ground truth instance segmentation label, we can have a metric learning loss. Uh, this loss will push 
pixels on the same objects close to the object center and also push away object centers far from each other. So by using this uh, metric learning laws, we can learn these feature embeddings such that pixels on the same objects are close to each other in the feature space and the pixels on different objects, they are separated. So with the learned features, we can simply apply a traditional clustering algorithm such as mean shift clustering to group these group this pixels into objects. Uh, so because our new approach is based on the uh, mean shift clustering, so let's dig into details about the VAM MySys feature mean shift clustering and see how does this uh, algorithm work. So first of all, the input to the mean shift clustering is a set of data points, X. Here we ha it has dimension N by C, where N is the number of pixels. We can do height multiply width, N is the number of pixels, and C is the dimension for each uh, uh, pixel feature. And in this uh, mean shift clustering algorithm, we assume all the feature embeddings are with unit length. So this feature, uh, they, they lie on the unit sphere. So in the beginning, we can randomly sample M initial clustering centers. So as you can see in this, in this image, these red dots indicates the initial clustering centers. So the mean shift clustering is going to iteratively update this clustering center so they can be separated and, and be the local minimal in the local feature space. So here, mu zero uh, indicates M, initial clustering centers, each with C dimension. So after the initial sampling, there's a for loop, and we, we, we keep updating the uh, clustering center. So if we do T iterations, uh, in, in each iteration, we first compute a weight matrix W uh, using this equation. <clears throat> so you can see here, mu T minus one is the previous clustering center. And the XT is the feature embedding for all the pixels. What this does is basically compute the cosine similarity between the clustering center and the pixels. Then we have a chi par as a hyperparameter to tune and use the exponential uh, to convert it to a weight matrix M multiply N, right? So that means M clustering centers with the weights to each pixel. By the way, if you have a Questions, uh, please feel free to interrupt, interrupt me. So this weight matrix basically consider the similarity of the clustering center to all the pixels. Then we can use this weight matrix to update the clustering center. What we do is we simply multiply the W matrix with all the pixels X. Because W is M by N, X is N by C, we still get a N by C vector. That is mu t for the t situation. So mu t indicates the updated cluster center after one iteration. After the metric multiplication, we need to normalize each zone of mu t. That's when we normalize each clustering center because in this uh, VM, VMF mean shift clustering, we assume all the feature embeddings and the cluster centers, they are uh, unit lengths. So after t iterations, the algorithm will find M clustering centers that they are well separated and they present a unique uh, local, local, local minimal in the feature space. The last stage of the algorithm is we merge clustering centers where the cosine similarity or cosine distance is smaller than uh, uh, epsilon. So if two clustering centers are very close to each other, we can merge them. So in this way, mean shift clustering can automatically discover how many objects are in the image uh, using this iterative updating of the clustering center. So after we found the clustering center, we just assign pixels to each clustering center based on the closest distance. So in this way, we can segment the uh, input image. Any questions for this algorithm? No, I think I think we're good. Mm -hmm. You have okay. I think that second trade is also possible. Like there are two trades.
uh, the question is, are you going to talk about the second stage as well? Second stage. Oh, that's a two stage segmentation in the paper. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to talk about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, but then we realized this algorithm can work, but there are some limitations. Uh, here I show you the segmentation results of this image. Mm -hmm. The limitation is that the, the mean shift clustering is non-differentiable. So, so in learning the network, we basically have a loss function on the feature map, and we train the network for, for uh, feature embeddings. After the training, we simply apply the mean shift clustering. Because the mean shift clustering is not differentiable, we cannot train this network end to end. There's a gap between the network and the clustering. So we cannot back back grad gradients from main shape to the feature map. Then the question we want to address is, can we learn a differentiable clustering module jointly with the image feature embeddings? In this way, we can have an end-to-end -end network. So we train both the feature embeddings and the parameters uh, if there's some parameter in the main shape clustering. So in general, if we train the clustering and the feature together, the performance can be improved. So this motivates us to think about, okay, how can we make the main shift clustering a differential module so we can embed it into the network? So uh, before I talk about the solution, I would like to review the transformer attention modules because our approach is based on the attention mechanism in transformer. So as you know, this, this transformer is dominating in both vision and NLP, right? The chat GPT is based on the transformer architecture. The paper uh, attention is all you need to propose this scale, the dot product attention mechanism. It's trying to compute the attention between uh, three entities, T, value, and query. So in this uh, formulation, the key K is basically a M by DK uh, matrix. That means M keys, each with DK dimension. And the V has a uh, same number of the uh, values, the value V has the same number as keys and values, but it comes with a different dimension. The query is n queries Q, right? We have n by dk because the query need to be compared with a key. The k and the Q should have the same dimension. The scale dot product attention is given by this formula. We first do the metric multiplication between Q and K, K transpose, to compare all the queries to the keys. Then uh, there's a normalize, normalizing factor, DK is the dimension. After that, we do softmax along the those. So we make it uh, the sum to one, right? Each those will sum to one. Then we multiply the, the V. You can think about the Python dictionary. We compare the, the, the query to the keys and uh, use the weights to combine the values. So this mechanism is called a scale dot uh, product product attention, and people use this uh, in the NLP and the vision transformers. So with that, I would like to uh, show you the connection between mean shift clustering and and this attention mechanism. So you will see we can use this att attention mechanism to convert the mean shift clustering into some uh, uh, transformer layers. So here, softmax. Uh, basically compute the weights, how can we combine the, the, v, the values? And we get uh, M by DV uh, per, uh, output from the attention layer. Okay. Then now let's compare two equations. The first equation is the VMF, mean shift, mean shift updating rule. We want to compute the uh, clustering center at the iteration T given the previous clustering center and the uh, pixel embeddings, right? That's the equation we have, we have seen so far. And on the second row, you see the scale dot product attention. If we compare these two, you can see the connection here is that, suppose we treat mu t minus one as q and x as k and v, p and the value, they, they are very similar to each other. Now, this tells us we can use this uh, tensor mechanism to do the mean shift updating 
in the Minshew clustering. That means if we use query as the clustering centers, and if we use the, all the pixel embeddings as key and value, we basically compare query to the keys. That means we compare the clustering center to the pixel embeddings, and then we update the clustering center. So then our solution to convert mainstream clustering into a differential module is use this uh, attention mechanism. So we introduced this uh, variant on the uh, attention mechanism called the hypersphere attention. The hypersphere attention, uh, because all the feature embeddings and the clustering centers in the MF, VMF mainstream clustering, they should, uh, they should be on the hypersphere with the unit lens. That's why we call this uh, hypersphere attention. So the difference between the hypersphere attention and the scaled the dot product attention as you can see in these two equations. So first of all, we use cosine similarity here uh, to compare the, the, the Q and the K with the G being the normalizing function because we need to normalize each query and each key to be a unit length. This can, can be interpreted as a cosine similarity. Then we, we keep the kappa uh, hyperparameter as in the mean shape clustering. And when we use softmax to convert this metric multiplication into a weight, then we multiply the V, the key, the values. After this, we use the G function to normalize the output again, because we want all the output of the hypersphere attention also be a union length. So that's the first, uh, um, that's the first novelty we propose. We introduce this hypersphere attention. On this figure, you can see what's the difference between the traditional attention and the hypersphere attention. The main difference is basically this L2 norm because we normalize all this uh, key and the value, key uh, query keys and the output of, of the attention into a unit length vector. And we introduce this kappa uh, hyperparameter. So with the hypersphere attention, we can convert the main shift clustering into multiple attention uh, layers in the transformer. So we, we can use the hypersphere attention to update the clustering center. As you can see from this equation, so mu L, it's M clustering centers, each with C dimension. And L here indicates the, the layer, the layer in the transformer. You can think about it's the iteration in the mean shift algorithm. Right, we want to update the clustering center. So we have a sum here that's a residual connection. We just update the clustering center by adding the output from the hypersphere tension. So the query Q is given by a, a, a mapping from the previous clustering center to the, uh, the, the query matrix. So query Q is also with dimension M by C. And for the keys and values, they are with dimension uh, H multiplied W, height, width, and channel. So these are the pixel embeddings. And they are all normalized with unit lengths. So from this equation, you can see, we basically compare the uh, previous clustering center against the pixel embeddings, and then add a mask. Uh, this, is, this M is called the attention, uh, attention mask. It's predicted by the neural network. So the neural network predicts this ML minus one. It's just a zero and a one matrix, but with dimension M multiply HW. So you can think about M is the number of uh, clustering centers, right? That means which pixel the clustering center attended to, either zero or, or one. If the network predicts zero, then we, don't, uh, we will mask out these elements. So this M matrix added here is called the mask. That's why we call this uh, main shift, masked main shift uh, attention. By adding that, we have a soft max to normalize the weights and multiply V and add it to the uh, previous clustering center. So in this way, you can see, we can use this uh, attention layer to update the clustering center.
here, this figure shows how, how can we uh, update the, the clustering centers. The queries here, you can interpret, it, interpret them as the clustering centers from the previous iteration. And the feature map uh, has a feature embedding for each pixel. The attention mask is the M matrix pre also predicted by the network. Then we use the feature map as key and the value and the clustering center as query. It will do some mechanism, the attention mechanism using the mask the mean shift cross attention. After that, we have a, we, we add the, uh, the query to the output because it's a residual connection as you can see in this sum here. We have a layer norm. After that, we have another mean shift uh, uh, self attention but in this layer, we don't have the attention mask. We added the residual connection again, do a, a fully connected layer with residual connection and they are norm. And finally, we normalize the, the, the queries. The output is another set of queries. That means another set of uh, clustering centers with normalized lens. So this block shows one, uh, one layer in the uh, main shift decoder. Main shift one main shift decoder layer. We can use this to update the clustering centers. Okay. I have a uh, question. So, um, mm -hmm. how do you predict the attention mask here? The attention mask is also given by the network. We'll just use the image features and uh, with a layer to predict uh, zero and one. So it's basically uh, by, by. features to predict the segmentation directly. Right, but it's not segmentation, just zero and one. That means the uh, attention. Mm. Okay. We, mm. And then we add it to the uh, decoder layer here. Okay, thank you. Mm. Thanks for the question. So uh, with this main shift decoder layer, we can build our uh, transformer architecture for unseen object instance segmentation. So let's see, we call this uh, mean shift mask transformer. We still take RGB image, RGB image as input. So for RGB image, we use ResNet to extract a uh, feature map height width by 64. And the same for the uh, depth map. We convert depth map into XYZ uh, point cloud image, so we can use three, we can use three channels and get the same uh, feature map, the same dimension feature map. After that, we sum the RGB feature and the depth feature. We have the combined feature for the image. So next, uh, we will initialize some lendable queries. So you can think about this as randomly randomly initialized. Uh, uh, the queries, they are 100 by 256. That means 100 clustering centers. So then these queries go through the main shift decoder layer by using the queries as, by using the query, the learnable queries and the KV key and the value from the feature map. We can do N main shift decoder layers. In the experiments, we try the six. We do six of these layers. Then the output of the, the layer here is another set of uh, object queries with the same dimension, 100 by 256. So 100 object queries. You can think about this as 100 clustering centers. Then we can simply uh, come do a multiplication between the queries and the feature embeddings to, to output 100 binary masks. So these pixels will be assigned to one of these object queries. In addition to the 100 mask, we also have a, a classification layer. This will just classify the query into zero and one. Zero means background, one means foreground. Because we do the unseen instance segmentation, we don't have object categories. And the, class, the classification score can be used as a confidence to tell us uh, how confident is this query to be an object or to be a background? So then we, then we can threshold this classification score to keep the high confidence masks. So the network always predicts 
100 masks, masks, but we just keep the high confidence ones. That will be five or six, depends on how many objects are in the image. So you can see from this network, we basically simulate the mean shift clustering with this uh, attention decoder layer with the learnable queries. So that's our new approach for answering object instance, instance segmentation. We call it mean shift mask attention. Um, and, th and this network can be trained end to end. In this way, we can jointly learn the features and the parameters in the uh, mean shift class screen. Okay. So uh, for the two stage approach, uh, one student asked, we still can have the two stage approach in this method. The first stage, we take the RGB and the depth image as inputs. We use one mean shift, uh, or one mask mean shift transformer to predict the initial label. Um, but in this example, you can see there's a, a orange on the can, but the first stage cannot segment it. So the second stage network basically work on the, uh, the region of interest for each segment. The first stage produce segment masks. Then we just crop each segment mask, crop the RGB and the depth image of each region of interest, and run and run another uh, mean shift transformer onto the segmented uh, image. In this way, for example, we can correctly uh, split the two objects in the first image and uh, obtain a better uh, uh, segmentation results. So the two stage network, they are trained differently. The first stage is trained with the whole image, but the second stage is trained with this region of interest. So the image size will be reduced. Uh, we, we train with uh, 256 by 256 for the second stage, but for the first stage, we train with 640 by 480 images. <clears throat> then, but in, in inference, we just concatenate the two stage and run, run on the images. So that's a two stage network. Okay. So for the experiments, uh, is there a question? Uh, yeah, you. There is a question. Oh. Okay. Uh, so the ROIs during testing time. Uh, how, how do you come to that? Like, uh, how, how do you cross uh, generate that? Oh, it's or, from the. Yeah, I, I can hear it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. The ROIs are from the initial label, right? The initial label will predict, let's say, five objects, as you can see in this example. Then we can. A uh, crop, a region of interest around the predicted initial label, that will be the input to the second stage. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, next, I'll talk about some uh, experiments of this method. The testing images are real world images. There are two data sets called OCID and OSD. The first data set is uh, the authors put objects one by one onto tabletops or, 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 or ground. They add object one by one so they can incrementally get the uh, ground truth masks. And the second data set is, is smaller. It's called OSD, Object Segmentation Database. It's a tabletop uh, object data set with uh, occlusions between these objects. So these are real world testing images. And for training, we follow the previous approaches and train the method on the synthetic data set. So this data set is called the uh, uh, tabletop object data set. We use uh, shape net 3D shapes and simulate uh, a, a 3D things with these objects. We basically put objects onto tables and then render RGB images around the table so we can get RGB depths and the segmented masks of these objects. This is done in the PyBully simulator. This data set has uh, 40,000 things with seven RGB images per scene for training. So we'll train on this data set and a test on two real world objects data set. Uh, so here's the results. You can see uh, we have done both RGB inputs and depths, RGBD, and compare with the previous approaches. 
So for RGB, uh, MS mean shift mask trans transformer, that's a new approach. It, it can improve the uh, segmentation accuracy compared to the, the, the previous approaches. Similarly for, for depths, um, although it's not as good as UCN for some metrics, but overall it achieves uh, very competitive results. And since we can train the, the, the network end to end, it shows uh, better performance in the real world testing. So here's some uh, quantitative, qualitative results from the method. It first, they'll show the input images. And second, though, is the initial label from the first, first stage uh, transform, transformer. And the last, they'll show the second stage transformer outputs. So, and the last two columns show the UCN results. And you can see for this image, UCN cannot segment the two objects, but this new approach can successfully segment the two objects. So uh, qualitatively, we see some improvements of this method over UCN. But the approaches still have some uh, failures. Here uh, are some representative failures. The first type is under segmentation. So the objects, when they are very close to each other, right, the network cannot separate them. Even with the two-stage approach, uh, the method still cannot separate them. The second type is over segmentation. If the object is occluded for the middle part, as you can see in this box, the network tend to uh, segment a, a single object as multiple objects. Uh, so these are some challenging cases we're still facing uh, with this method. So, um, so you is this failure case using RGBD as well? Yes, it's RGBD, but but still it cannot uh, correctly segment it. Okay. So because we still have these failures, uh, then we think about okay, how can we fix these failures? Okay, so basically there are two directions we can try. The first direction is we can use better models. Uh, previous, uh, previously, we, we used ResNet, right? How about we try swing transformers or the open air clip or, or even other better models? This can improve the performance. Another idea is can we have better training data, right? Pre the, the approach is trained purely with synthetic data. And these synthetic data are not photorealistic, they are rendered from pipe bullets. For example, we can use photorealistic synthetic data set. Here are some examples from the uh, UOAIS net. They use photorealistic synthetic data set and they show training with these data improve the performance. But how about, can we get some real world data? Why not just train with real world data and uh, apply it to the real world test, test images? But then the difficulty is, it's really hard to get real world data. If you think about this data set uh, in the computer vision community, right? ImageNet, Coco, they are all internet images. But in robotic settings, we care about this tabletop or cabinet drawers. There's no much data set in this domain, right? How can we obtain a real world data set to train the unseen object instance of this segmentation network? Um, so we propose a solution. How can we get the real world data set? We call it self supervised uh, unseen object instance segmentation. We try to leverage object, in, object interaction with objects, and then the robots can automatically get the training data in the real world. So let's see how this method work. Um, so we start with the synthetic data trained network, by for example, the UCN or the uh, mean shift mask transformer. These are segmentation networks trained with synthetic data. If we directly apply the synthetic data training network to the, the to this input image, it has failures. It cannot separate objects that are very close to each other. So suppose we can have the robots, and the robots can push this object, and then after pushing, it's automatically collect data, generates segmentation masks of the pushed objects, then the robots will automatically collect 
a set of training data in the real world. So then we can fine tune this segmentation network to improve it, fine tuned with the real world training data. Then we show that after this fine tuning, the performance of the segmentation can be improved. So with the real world fine tuning, in this case, we can correctly segment these objects. But the difficulty in this approach is how can we leverage absorber pushing to collect data and it generates ground truth segmentations so we can use this data to fine tune the network. Um, so then we propose a solution. We leverage long-term global interaction with objects. The idea of pushing has been explored by the robotic community, but all the previous approach, they simply push object once and then segments which object is moved. Using a single pushing has some limitation. For example, if the robot push, but two objects moves, they will segment two objects. So in this case, they cannot get the ground truth mask by a single push. Our idea is, is to leverage a long-term robot interaction. Here is robot pushing. Suppose the robots continuously push five objects. Let's say the robot pushes 20 times. And in the end, ideally, these objects should be separated. Then we can use this video sequence to obtain segmentation masks of every image. That's our idea of uh, the self-supervised data collection. So here's an example, right? We, we present five objects in front of the robots. This is a fetch mobile manipulator. And we intentionally put these objects very close to each other because these cases are very difficult for the robot to segment. Then we use motion planning and the initial object segmentation to plan pushing actions. The robot is continuously push these objects until the end. So in the end, very likely these objects will be separated. So during this pushing, we can capture RGB and the depth images. So these images are captured during the robot pushing. And we can also obtain some initial segmentations from our synthetic data training network. So these masks are from the MSM transformer applied to the collected image. So you can, you can see there are some errors in these images. For example, I'm pointing the segmentation errors. The first image is very challenging because all the objects are packed together. The network just segmented as a single object. So this, in this image, uh, there are five objects, but the network only produced three segments. The, there are two, two more errors. But when the objects are separated, the network can successfully segment them. Then suppose we have this data as inputs, right? Can we have an algorithm that will use this data and produce correct segmentation for every image? We can do this by leveraging optical flow, optical flow based multi object tracking and the video object segmentation. I will show you how can we do this. But the output of this system is we have correct segmentation masks for every image the robot collected during pushing. So in this example, we correctly segment all these five objects. You can see for the first image, uh, the, these objects can be correctly segmented. Suppose we use this data to fine tune the network, ideally, the robots will segment these objects successfully. So we call this uh, self-supervised unseen object instance segmentation by leveraging long-term robot interaction. The novelty is basically to leverage long-term pushing. All the previous approach, they just push it once, but we push about 20 times and get all this data. Uh, you, mm -hmm. are you going to talk about like how you are determining how to push, like the push action? Oh, so basically that part is, uh, I don't have in the slides, but the idea is uh, you have this initial segmentation, right? Then we can randomly pick one segment because we have point cloud of the segments. We just uh, uh, do a motion plan of the double gripper to either left or right of the, of the segments and the push the object to the left or to the right. Oh, let me show you a video so you can see how the pushing work. Okay. Right, so basically uh, we use this segmentation mask to guide the pushing. 
and here's the motion planning thing. We plan the motion to either to the left or to the right of the objects. And the robots always push the objects to the center. In this case, we can prevent the object being pushed out of reach. But this is not a policy, just a program the, uh, you can think about the motion uh, primitive, right? Just move there and push left or right. Right. right, so uh, in the code, we, we say uh, you, you have to push the, each object three times. In, so usually in each video sequence, the, the robot has uh, 20 pushes. So we can get about 20 images. Then we can get RGB depths and the initial segmentations. Mm -hmm. So, but the, the, the question is with this initial segmentation and the images, how can we generate the final segmentation that are cracked, right? Our idea is based on uh, multi-object tracking. Uh, so the input of the multi-object tracking is the images with the initial segmentation. And then we start from the last frame because in the last frame, these objects are likely to be separated. So we try to link the mask to the previous frames. For example, if we take this object, if we do the tracking, we will do some data association and then link these objects to the previous, to one of the previous segments and so on, right? In the multi-object tracking domain, once we get this trajectory, they call it tracklet. It's like a short sequence of the objects. But in order to do the tracking, we need to have some data association uh, measurements that tell us uh, how, how likely this mask should be associated with another mask. If we can have a, such a score or measurement, we can just do a, a greedy search and the link all these uh, initial segmentations. So our measurements of the data association is based on optical flow, and uh, uh, and it's a very good measurements to tell us which objects to be associated together. Here's an example: uh, we have two images from time one to time uh, time two, right? Uh, so we can compute optical flow from one mask to all the other masks. In this example, you can see because this is a, a incorrect segmentation. If we compute the optical flow to one of the mask, some pixels will fall outside of the the mask here, right? Then this is some signal to tell us uh, they are not likely to be associated together, or there's something wrong in the segmentation. We we use forward flow that means from time t one to time t two, but we can also compute backward flow from T2 to T1. In this case, the, the pixel in this mask all fall into the, uh, the, this mask. But we, by combining the forward flow and the backward flow, we can compute a score between two masks across the, the time steps. In this case, because some pixels of this mask fall outside the, uh, the, the right mask, the score is low. The score is basically based on the intersection of union of the propagated pixels using optical flow. The optical flow is computed uh, by a neural network. It's a flow net, a pre-trained uh, uh, neural network. Then we can use optical flow to propagate pixels to, to, uh, to the other image. And we count, we count uh, the intersection of, intersection of a union of the propagated pixels and the mask on that image. So if there's something, yes, if there's some segmentation error, the score will be low, as you can see in this case. But if the segmentation is cracked, uh, as you can see in this, in this case, the, the tomato is correctly segmented in two frames. Both the forward flow and the backward flow will, will propagate the pixels to the correct region. Then the, the score will be high. So, our tracking is, is basically based on computing the data association score, data association score between every pair of a mask, and then choose the highest uh, segments to link. We don't, we don't 
we didn't apply a very complicated multi-object tracking algorithm. We just computed the matching scores and then do a grid search from the last frame to the previous frames. In this way, given a video sequence, we can obtain a set of track leads. So uh, then we will use this track leads to guide us how to, how to segment all the images. Okay, so this is the multi-object tracking part. Once we get a track lead, the next question we're thinking about is, how can we generate the masks for all the images? So you can think about each track lead, it's very likely to be a single object. Because this data association score, run masks wouldn't be associated to, to one of these track leads. We can filter out these, these run segmentations. So a single track lead, it's very likely to be a single object. Then suppose we pick one mask in the, in the track lead and the propagate these correct masks to all the other frames, we can obtain the segmentation of these objects in the whole video sequence. We call this mask, prop mask propagation using video object segmentation. So we leverage a, a state-of-art video object segmentation method called uh, uh, XMEM. They use some long-term memory to segment uh, objects given an initial segmentation. So in this example, suppose we pick a frame 20 as our initial mask. That means we initialize the segmentation method with this mask and then propagate this mask to all the other frames. So we choose 20, we propagate to 10. That means we just use this mask to initialize this method and segment these objects. So you can see you can correctly, correctly segment the objects in all the frames, even if the object is in clutter with other objects. So in this way, we can get a segmentation of these objects in all the video frames we collected. So here's another example. If we pick the initial mask for this object, we can propagate or segment all the other image frames. So we do this for every track lead. For every track lead, we select the initial mask and then propagate the mask to all the other images. And finally, we can combine all the masks on every single time step. That's how we obtain the final segmentation results of this method. Uh, so here are some examples you can see. In the middle, you see the initial segmentation. There are errors. But the final segmentation using this algorithm based on uh, multi-object tracking and the video object segmentation, we can correctly segment all these objects. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's about 95% accurate in the final segmentation. So for example, if you compare these two images, the initial segmentation has some errors, but the final one after this processing can correctly segment it. So then we will use this final segmentation as our ground truth labels, and then we can use this data to fine tune the pre-trained networks. That's the idea of this uh, a uh, self-supervised uh, unseen object instance segmentation by leveraging robot interaction with objects. So next, I will show you some results. Um, in this table, MF indicates the, the, the mask, the mean shift mask transformer. That's the transformer model for unseen in object instance segmentation I just introduced. With a star, that means we use the real world data to, to fine tune it. So the table here shows the segmentation results in the training domain. That means we collect uh, training examples in this tabletop, but we have some held, held out test images that the network is not fine tuned on, and then we test on these images. So you can see after fine tuning, we can significantly improve the, the segmentation accuracy. Uh, we also try to fine tuning either of the one one of the stage, we have two stage network, right? Zoom in indicates the second stage. We can fine tune the first stage or fine tune the second stage or fine tune both of them. Uh, if we fine tune both of them, we'll obtain the best results as you can see in the in this slope. We tried both RGB input and RGB input. We achieve about 
more than 90 F1 scores in the same training domain. But this is understandable, right? Suppose we get training, we get training images in the same domain and fine tune network. Uh, the net network can improve the, the same domain. Uh, so here are some examples. Before fine tuning, the network cannot segment flattered objects. After fine tuning, the network can successfully segment this. We also apply the, the fine tuned network to different domains, right? We fine tune in this tabletop domain, but we test the fine tuned model on the two data sets, OCID and OSD. Uh, that's different domain. So we also show that the fine tuned network can improve the segmentation accuracy on the different domain data sets. Uh, this table shows how many things we use for fine tuning, and these are the number of images used for fine tuning. In total, we only use 15 things with about 300 images for fine tuning. And the performance is almost saturated at uh, about 300 images. That means we don't need uh, thousands of images to fine tune the network. Otherwise, it will, very, it will be very expensive to collect a lot of, lot of real world images. So next, I will show you uh, if we can correctly segment the objects, we can do a top-down grasping of these objects. So here's a video we compare the grasping performance uh, using two segmentation models, fine-tuned one and the baseline one. The task is to pick up some objects and then put it into the bin. So on the bottom, you can see the algorithm can also segment the bin, so we know where to put. The baseline model sometimes cannot separate objects. Then the motion planning will plan some action, as you can see in this example, right? Try to grasp two objects, but this will cause a, a, fat a fatal failures. That's why we stop the robots. Otherwise, it's gonna break these objects or broke the gripper. But overall, the fine-tuned one, because it can successfully segment these objects, the grasping performance is improved. Oh, just let it play, and you can see uh, more examples of this segmentation. And here we just do top-down grasping. Uh, the grasp planning is simple. We just move to the top of the segmentation mask and align the gripper to the shorter axis of the segments, and then go down to pick it up. Some other examples. So, uh, you, uh, I have a question. So, is is there a constraint that the objects have to be on the table? Um, the segmentation network, right? It, it's trained on tabletop things. If we try it in the bin or in some shelf. Segmentation performance is not that good unless we generate the data in these domains. Basically, the training data set is all tabletop. That's why we, we test the segmentation network in tabletop. Mm -hmm. But for other domains, not tabletop, top down grasping wouldn't work, right? Then we need a better planning or 60 grasping for that. Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And would the application of this kind of system be to like deploy a robot to an unseen like environment and let it play with objects to rapidly fine tune on a new sort of set of domains? Is that the hope? Yeah, that could be one application, right? If the robot in a new domain, it sees some objects cannot segment, it can interact with these objects to get some training data. And next time after fine tuning, the robot can recognize these objects. So, um, but this is a, some preliminary uh, study on this direction. Uh, it, this is a definitely a, a challenging problem to, to explore, explore, right? We, we just deploy robots to a completely unseen domain. 
in this experiments, well, the like the students put this object onto the table, then the robot start pushing, right? If it's fully unconstrained environments, uh, how can you, how can you deploy this robot to that environments and do the pushing? That will be a, 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 an interesting question. And like in the first stage where you do the instant segmentation, right? So how do you decide the number of clustering centers that according to the maximum classification labels you have? Uh, sorry, I couldn't quite get the question. So in the first stage, like the number of clustering centers you choose, right? Like in the model was 100. So how do you decide that? So how do you decide the number of cluster centers? Oh, I see. 100 is basically a hyperparameter. Uh, but it's large enough, right? In an image, it's very rare you have more than 100 objects. That's why we choose 100. Uh, but because each cluster, each object segmentation has a, a score, we can just stress hold the, the, the score to get a, the number of objects. But we just, we simply set 100, uh, follow, follow previous approaches. Uh, okay. Uh, the voice is quite uh, spoken. Can you? I was asking the, if there are unknown objects, right? So right. When, when you segment those unknown objects, you just ignore those, or do you fine tune it and add those to them? Um, I, it, it's when we present this object to the robot, right? They are unknown. Then we apply the unseen object in segmentation to, to guide how to push. After pushing, we can get segmentation masks of these unknown objects. So we, we can fine tune the network. But we didn't test on the training object. We test on new objects. So the testing is still unseen objects with respect to the, the, the fine tuning network. I think if I understand the question, it's more like, can you do like some sort of continual learning where you have unseen objects, you do this segmentation, and then you keep adding that to your training if necessary. I think uh, it kind of couples with the interactive segmentation and then you add the data into, um, mm -hmm. but, I guess, but I guess that's what you're doing in general. Yeah, but I think definitely we can, we can do that. It's just to require some user in the loop, right? After right. the lower push a set of objects, you need to replace with another set. Uh, and also the training need to be online as well, right? You keep updating the, the network. Actually, continuous learning is also a very promising direction to explore. Okay, so with that, let, let me conclude my uh, talk today. I basically talk about two works. The first one is called the Mean Shift Mask Transformer for Unseen of the Instant Segmentation. You can check the archive paper. Uh, the idea is we can convert the traditional VMF mean shift clustering into decoder layers. Then the, each iteration in the mean shift clustering will be a, a, a transformer decoder layer. We can do multiple decoder layers to update the clustering center. Then we have we have an end to end network that combines the feature learning and the mean shift clustering. So we can train the model end to end. The second one is a self supervised. Uh, and seeing all the instant segmentation. So we leverage uh, long-term over interaction with objects. I emphasize long-term because that's people haven't done before. Previously, they just push one or once, then get the mask. It's clearly when you push it once for cluttered objects, the, the object cannot be separated. That's why we leverage long-term robot pushing. Uh, for the technical contribution, we combine multi object tracking with the video of the instant video object segmentation to get the ground truth masks. Then we can use this to fine tune the uh, network trained with synthetic data. So we can improve the segmentation results in the real world. Uh, so this is my email. If you have a question, you can send an email to me and I'm happy to answer more questions uh, if you have. Uh, first of all, let's thank you and then uh, we can have some discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have one question in the long term robot interaction and how you are doing the multi object tracking. So, you mentioned two things. One is 
you did the optical flow based approach and then you leverage the uh, XMEM paper. So I was wondering which is the one that you're using? Oh, it's a, it's a pipeline method. We first do multi-body tracking to get a track lit, right? For example, in this example, we can get a track lit of this one, of these objects. Then we need to select one of these masks in the track lit. Suppose I select this one, then I will use the XMEM to propagate this, ma this mask to all the other images. So it's so first do multi-body tracking to get a track lit, then apply the video objects instance, video object segmentation. I see. Because I'm assuming uh, like if you just use optical flow where the, the let's say the flow is too large between two frames, the traditional optical flow would not work, right? Yes. And also there, there are segmentation error, right? For example, if we check the, this error, uh, we cannot link these objects to this mask because yeah. the the optical flow score will be very low. In this case, we don't link them, then this track lead will be stopped here. But how can we segment these objects? We will apply the video of the X, X mem to segment these objects. Got it. Right, right, that's, so that's the idea. Will, so X mem will be applied to the entire video where the robot gripper is available. It is also like, it's, it's kind of used for the entire video rather than just two frames, right? Yes, exactly. It, it, it will apply to every frame. So that's why we can, we can segment all the objects. But it's important to pick the correct initial mask, right? For example, if you pick a wrong mask that contains two objects, it will always segment the two objects. So, but we use the track lead and find a high confidence score in the track lead to initialize X, X man, then we, we, we track. We segment the whole whole video. Got it. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So, if you are doing uh, the mean shift algorithm in the feature space that's already extracted like visual features, um, mm -hmm. is there any inductive bias that goes into like the spatial element of it? For example, if you have very similar looking objects at different locations of the image, they should technically get similar like pixel features? Like would the model be able to differentiate between those? Oh, that's a good question. I think that the location also matters because uh, the network uh, definitely will consider the, the location of the, of the object in the image. But it's challenging if uh, two very similar objects they are together. They are very close to each other. So then in that case, it will segment it as a whole. That's what will be the under segmentation case. So the information about the location is also like um, included in the pixel-wise features in this case? Uh, we, yeah, we didn't in explicitly input the coordinates but we're basically trying with a lot of images. I think the network somehow will learn from that. Right, based on the viewpoint or the angle it's looking at. Okay, that answered mm -hmm. it, thank you. Thank, thanks for the question. Any questions for you? So what is the next step after this, you, in this line of work? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so we're looking at, some, some idea on, on few shots, object segmentation. Because now we're taking unseen, right? What if we have a few examples per image? Oh, sorry, per objects. Can we do few shots segmentation? Because right now we can segment objects, but the robot doesn't have any idea what are these objects, right? What can you do with these objects? If we can do some few shots, maybe the robot can recognize what's the class, uh, like what's the, we can associate the semantic information to the, to the segments with a few short examples. Mm -hmm. That's one direction. Um, but definitely the performance of the unseen object instance segmentation can be, can be improved. Right? For example, as you mentioned, different domain, can we segment beams, shelves, 
that's what we need some data set on that. Uh, but on the network side, people could also explore new architectures, right? This, this kind of transformer, uh, they are very powerful these days. So we see improvements with the transformer architectures. No questions. I think we can thank you once again and um, thanks for doing this. Yeah, uh, thanks for inviting me and I hope you yeah. hope you enjoy the talk. Yeah, this was great. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, yeah, I think that's the end of the lecture. Thank you so much. Okay. See you. I think I'll talk to you.